Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Doug Jesmer with NOAA's National Ocean Service Public Affairs team. Thank you for joining us for today's press conference. We'll discuss NOAA's 2024-25 annual high tide flooding outlook for the United States. To provide more details, we welcome Nicole LaBeouf, Director of NOAA's National Ocean Service, who will provide an overview of today's news, and four NOAA experts who will join us for Q&A. From NOAA's Center for Operational Oceanographic Products and Services, we have Coastal Hazards Oceanographers Karen Cavanaugh and Annalise Keeney, and climate scientist and oceanographer Dr. John Callahan. And joining us from NOAA's National Ocean Service Headquarters, oceanographer Dr. William Sweet. Now a few housekeeping items before we get started. First, this press conference is being recorded. If you do not wish to be recorded, please disconnect at this time. We will begin with remarks from Nicole LaBeouf and then take questions from reporters. If you would like to ask a question, click the hand icon in the GoToWebinar window next to your name. NOAA staff will call on each reporter who has virtually raised their hand and your line will be unmuted. You can also use the questions tool in your GoToWebinar window to type a question for our speakers. Please be sure to state, state or type your full name and media affiliation when asking your question. With that, it's my honor to open our call today with the director of NOAA's National Ocean Service. Here's Nicole LaBeouf. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Nicole LaBeouf, the director of NOAA's National Ocean Service. Today, NOAA released its 2024-2025 annual high tide flooding outlook. Bottom line, over the past year, we've seen record coastal flooding or high tide flooding along our coastlines. When the ocean runs hot, sea levels run high. And we see that playing out in our coastal flooding data. During the 2023-2024 season, U.S. coastal communities experienced about seven to eight flood days. In fact, 34 locations broke or tied their records for flood days in 2023, a dramatic increase compared to just eight or broken or tied records from the previous year. So what happened? Basically, hot open temperatures led to the highest levels of sea level measurement on record. 44 of our tide gauge locations, mostly on the East Coast, broke or tied their previously recorded sea levels to date. That means we got an additional six inches of sea level rise and five median coastal flood days annually compared to the year 2000, roughly a 200% increase. Contributing to the record-breaking 2023-2024 observations is the recurring climate pattern we call El Nino. El Nino typically raises ocean temperatures and can result in more frequent and intense storms hitting the coastlines, especially along the East Coast where we saw many records break this past year. With sea level rise and high tide flooding increasing, El Nino simply makes things worse for coastal communities, home to almost 40% of the U.S. population. High tide flooding can degrade infrastructure, damage property, and disrupt coastal ecosystems and people's daily lives. That's why NOAA helps communities predict high tide flooding and its potential impacts. High tide flooding, sometimes called nuisance or sunny day flooding, happens when tides reach anywhere from one to two feet above the daily average high tide, covering what is typically dry land along the coast. As sea levels continue to rise, high tide flooding occurs more frequently, even without severe weather. To measure high tide flooding, NOAA maintains tide gauges across the United States and its territories, making up NOAA's National Water Level Observation Network. Some of our tide gauges have been recording water level data for more than 150 years, providing critical long-term data sets that support coastal decision making. Through this network, NOAA monitors the unrelenting creep of sea level rise and the rapid increase of high tide flooding. Our 2024 annual high tide flooding outlook brings together data about high tide flooding events recorded at 97 NOAA tide gauges between May 2023 and April 2024. We position the annual outlook around this span of time to account for increased sea levels in the fall and increased stormy weather during winter months so that we can most effectively predict the year ahead. As I mentioned before, 34 locations broke or tied records for high tide flooding days 
in 2023. On the East Coast, Atlantic City, New Jersey recorded its highest number of flood days, 26, a large increase from just eight days in 2022. Our station at the Battery in New York measured 24 days, while Charleston, South Carolina observed 17 days of high tide flooding. Almost every location we measure between New York and Georgia broke their sea level and flood day records in 2023. It's like El Nino had the U.S. East Coast in its bullseye. And along the Gulf Coast, St. Petersburg, Florida observed six flood days, its highest number on record, while the Galveston Pier in South Texas saw 23 days, an increase from eight flood days in 2022. Increased high tide flooding did not spare the West Coast. San Diego, California observed 12 flood days, one day shy of its previous record. So how much high tide flooding can we expect in the coming year? NOAA projects that U.S. coastal communities will see a median range of four to eight high tide flooding days between May 2024 and next April. That's slightly down from last year as we move away from El Nino and into La Nina conditions. That said, NOAA has predicted an above, above normal 2024 Atlantic hurricane season, increasing the chance of significant flooding in some places like along the Atlantic and Gulf coasts. This is playing out in real time now with, with now Tropical Storm Debbie, which made landfall yesterday in the Big Bend region of Florida and is creeping northward towards coastal South Carolina right now. These two areas are already under the thumb of sea level rise, making the combination of Debbie's rainfall and storm surge potentially catastrophic. While hurricane predictions are not directly factored into NOAA's high tide flooding outlooks, our outlooks can provide situational awareness regarding baseline flooding that can compound the impacts from real time weather events like hurricanes and tropical storms. Events like hurricanes get a lot of attention, but high tide flooding is one of the most tangible impacts of long-term sea level rise, reminding us that while we brace for impact today, the United States must also plan for a wetter future. By 2050, NOAA predicts that coastal communities across the nation will experience an average of 45 to 85 high tide flood days per year. That means every four to eight days, Americans along our coast will face disruptive and damaging seawater inundation, regardless of the weather at the time. The good news is that NOAA delivers data directly to support coastal communities making decisions about flooding over the next year and into the future. In addition to the annual high tide flooding outlook, NOAA now also provides a monthly high tide flooding outlook. NOAA's monthly high tide flooding outlook provides flooding likelihoods each day of the year up to a year in advance, offering windows of time where there's increased flood risks. Together, these outlooks complement one another with information across timescales to protect lives, properties, ecosystems, and economies. As towns, states, tribes, and businesses are faced with increased coastal flooding, NOAA's National Ocean Service is the authoritative source of information on a wide range of risks from real-time flooding to long-term sea level trends. With that, thank you again for joining us today. I will now turn the call back over to Doug, who will facilitate questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. We're now gonna take reporter questions about today's news. Now, just to remind everyone, if you'd like to ask a question, please click the hand icon in the GoToWebinar window next to your name in the attendees list that appears to the right of your screen. NOAA Communications will call upon each reporter who has a virtually raised hand. Once you are called upon, your line will be unmuted. You may also need to unmute yourself by selecting the microphone icon next to your name, and you can ask your question then. You may also use the questions tool in your GoToWebinar window to type a question for our speakers about today's report. Just ensure that you state or type your full name and media affiliation when asking your question. Now, please note, this time is specifically reserved for questions from the media. And if you'll wait with us just a moment, we're going to get ready for the questions. Stand by, please.
No questions so far. Hmm, let's see. Once again, we are taking reporter questions about today's news. You can either type your question into the chat or you can virtually raise your hand and your line can will be unmuted at that time and you can you can ask your questions. Again, we are taking your questions now. All right, we have our first question. Uh, this question is from Rebecca Hersher. This is for Dr. Sweet. Uh, can you elaborate on the long-term trend? Is the number of high tide flood days accelerating? Hi, yes, thank you for the question. Yes, in the majority of East and Gulf Coast locations, the rate of high tide flooding on an annual basis is is accelerating meaning it's growing in leaps and bounds nationally we, we see the same pattern heavily weighted by the east and gulf coast so what this means is incremental changes inches matter an inch or two of sea level rise can exponentially increase the number of high tide flood days that a community exists this the sea level rise impacts playing out uh, front and center and this is direct evidence of sea level rise in, in our communities increased frequency of high tide flooding All righty, thank you, Dr. Sweet. Next question is for Dr. Callahan from David Borax, who's asking, can you go over the methodology for this again? Is it like previous years looking at high tides above a certain level? Yes, uh, thank you for that uh, question. Uh, good, good question. The methodology is the same. It's looking at number of days above a certain level. And it uses the trends that we've seen in the past and we continue that into the future but we do take into account the prevalence and strength of the enso phase whether it's el nino or la nina but it's the same methodology we have used in recent years yes all right thank you dr callahan the next question is for dr sweet uh, dan peck at abc news is asking why during our triple dip La Nina did we still have lots of king tide events in places like Miami? Or maybe it was fewer, but we just didn't notice. Well, you know, El Nino can make a mess of things on the mid-Atlantic, but it doesn't mean to say that sea level rise and global warming are not playing out in front of our eyes. You know, the oceans are running hot and they're running high. Sea levels are at the brim in many communities and just a garden variety of reasons why we're flooding now, a change of prevailing winds, a full moon tide, you name it, decades of sea level rise are catching up. El Nino can make it worse, but La Nina does not necessarily make it better. And so that's why over the last few years, we still had been breaking records, but this year in particular, we have a an extra kicker. It's the El Nino, one of the fifth strongest on record, made a mess of things. But El Nino, La Nina alike, no matter what phase we're in, we have continuous sea level rise and that's playing in the background and that's what's pushing our sea levels higher and flooding our communities more often. Thank you, Dr. Sweet. And uh, while you're there, don't go anywhere. The next question is from uh, Craig Miller of PBS Next Avenue. And this question is for you, but also if uh, Annalise or Karen would like to jump in as well, can you amplify a bit on how this is not just a Southeast or Gulf Coast problem? Are cities doing enough to prepare? It's really a national problem. It's a global problem. Sea levels are rising and they're rising at an increasingly high rate along the United States coastline. You know, our communities, many of which have been uh, built on fill centuries ago, but right up to the edge of the ocean, uh, it made sense then. Now, again, with decades of sea level rise, we're finding increasing number of high tide flood events on the East Coast, Gulf Coast, 
West Coast or Pacific Island. So it's really a national issue that we're dealing with right now. Sea level rise, plain and simple, is caught up and we're paying the, the consequences. Yep, that's exactly right. We're seeing it uh, across the country, and that's why we make our products and services valuable for coastal communities at a variety of timescales. If you need to know something for tomorrow, we've got you. If you need to know what it looks like a month from now to be able to plan your resources, we've got that too. Do you want to focus more on long-term restoration and resilience? That's exactly what we're able to provide to through the variety of timescales from the monthly to the annual outlook as well. And NOAA also provides training to communities um, because not everyone knows how to use these products immediately. So that's something that we've been working on and partner offices as well. It's reaching out um, because each community is being impacted differently, even though they're all experiencing these impacts. So it's important to give them the data in a usable way um, so that they can translate it to their own plans that suit them and prioritizing you know, neighborhoods that are most impacted, um, adapting to protect cultural landmarks as well. Um, so, Okay, just to uh, follow up on that question just now, um, this this is for Nicole and for Billy. Um, are cities doing enough to prepare? Yeah, thanks, Doug. I'll I'll jump in and happy for um, Billy to follow with any um, with any uh, specific details. I think it varies widely um, what cities um, understand about their risks um, and what they're able to do about their risks. Um, our products and services are certainly um, uh, out there and we're trying to make sure that communities know that those are available. But in addition to that, one of the things that NOAA finds very important is what we call technical assistance. And that is our ability to engage directly with communities um, and municipalities uh, to help understand the uh, the data and the trends, um, certainly more than we're talking about today, but how it what it means for their specific location, helping them to understand these data at planning timescales and in practical ways that towns and cities and others can really take to heart and start making plans around. Um, our ability to do that varies uh, widely um, uh, from city to city, um, in town to town, uh, based on our capacity, but also um, uh, the threat to those individual locations. Um, we are uh, working uh, very closely um, with funds that were provided by the Inflation Reduction Act to implement a program called the Coastal Resilience Regional Challenge, where we're actually working with coalitions of cities and towns and other stakeholders to get into the communities and help them understand what data and projections are available to them and understand their particular risks so that they can make uh, informed decision making. Um, so I, I would say um, the bottom line is it varies quite a bit, but we're doing as much as we possibly can uh, to get into those communities and help them plan ahead. And I'll, I'll add a bit that solutions definitely are found and funded locally currently. Collectively, we're all in the same boat. And one thing that we strive for at NOAA is to make sure that we get the best science in those communities' hands so that they can use their resources on solution space. All right, thank you, Nicole and, and Dr. Sweet. Um, next question is actually for Dr. Sweet. It's from Karen Reeves. Uh, she's asking, I see your press release says there will be fewer high tide flood days in 2023 than in 2024. Why is that? Um, to clarify the question, less high tide flood days are projected our outlook. Um, well, as we transition to La Nina from El Nino, what that typically means is a, a different storm track. El Nino steers storms at the mid-Atlantic, and that's the way that it sets up. It's really a double whammy. Not only is it steering storms at the coast, 
it tweaks the prevailing winds uh, and causes water to pile up along our coast, the east coast in particular. On the west coast, El Nino uh, has a direct effect of warmer temperatures, higher sea levels. La Nina, on the other hand, uh, doesn't have that same effect on the east coast. The storm tracks are different and the seas set down lower on the west coast. So given that, we expect some bumps and wiggles on our trend. We still expect record-breaking uh, high tide flooding as sea level continues to push up against our communities, but we have year-to-year -year variability. La Nina typically means a little less threat than El Nino. Thank you, Dr. Sweet. Uh, next question comes from, from Rebecca Hersher, and this question is for Annalise and Karen. Some members of the public might wonder why a couple inches of water in the street is so bad. Can you talk more about why high tide flooding is bad and what costs are? That's a great question, Rebecca. Um, the, the long and the short of it is that we have to plan for where this, this water is moving, knowing that the sea levels are rising. So high tide flooding is actually considered minor flooding in our um, you know, in, in our in our science, but because it happens more frequently and it is the mo and it happens consistently and is predicted to increase, you have further impacts over time. So in the annual high tide flooding outlook, you'll actually notice that we use the minor high tide flooding threshold is visualized in red because it is more frequent and the impacts are are greater over time. Um, thinking about long term planning, you have saltwater intrusion just with the high high raising sea levels ends up creating more like you know saline and salt water that comes up to our coastlines and into our infrastructure that has the potential to degrade things over time so that's just one perspective or one example from the annual um, side of the house that explains why even a couple inches of water are so impactful yeah and just like from the impacts you feel now it's like talking about people living in the Keys or Annapolis or Norfolk, they, they're facing traffic delays, like dropping them their kids off to school or getting to work because there's water that's flooding the streets and not necessarily because of a storm. This is happening because of just high tide, higher than normal tides. And so you're not expecting that they need to check the weather forecast to give themselves an extra 20 minutes to get to work. Like, so that's just like the tangible impacts now that people are experiencing are inconveniences. Um, it's also, you know, contamination of like, because the um, water is actually bringing up sewage onto the streets. So you, you can't really walk in, in that um, water. Um, and business closures, people like aren't expecting this flooding, but are gonna like have storefronts that are flooded out um, so people can't get to the local restaurants and stuff. And that happens in the like shore town that I've been going to for the past 35 years of my life in New Jersey. It's like you have strong above normal high tides and then things flood out and you can't get to the downtown and people are fa like facing the cars be coming damaged by the salt water as well. So um, like Anna was saying, these, these effects, these impacts accelerate and um, accumulate over time and become more and more um, damaging. But even in the short term, it's something that people need to be aware of and, and um, mitigate. And, and when the high tide flooding is just the baseline, so when you add two to three inches to the baseline of where water's gonna go, when you have extreme events, like the hurricane season that we've predicted, even what's happening now in parts of Florida, when the baseline is already higher, waters, like the impacts are gonna be greater as well. So an inch or two of water really does have a substantial impact. I just wanna add on too, I also like to think about um, like we're talking about coastal communities, but that because our ports infrastructure is in these coastal communities as well, 
when the ports are impacted, when our um, shipping industry is impacted by these traffic delays, that Im impacts people no matter where you are in the country. We rely on shipping for our cars and sneakers and everything. So when they're um, in impacted by this, it's, we're all seeing um, detrimental impacts. All right, thank you, Karen and Annalise. Just to remind everyone, if you'd like to ask a question, please click the hand icon in the GoToWebinar window next to your name in the attendees list that appears to the right of your screen. No communications will call upon each reporter who has a virtually raised hand. Once you're called on, your line will be unmuted. You may also need to unmute yourself by selecting the microphone icon next to your name, and you can ask your question. You can also use the questions tool in your GoToWebinar window to type a question for our speakers. Please be sure to state or type your name and your media affiliation when you're asking your questions. Not seeing any more questions. With that, we thank our speakers today. NOAA's National Ocean Service Director, Nicole LaBeouf, as well as our experts, Karen, Annalise, John, and William for answering questions today. A recording of today's briefing will be posted online shortly and linked from both our press release and media advisory, which are available on NOAA.gov in the news section. Also want to thank the NOAA communications staff for their role in uh, today's event. And finally, if you have any follow-up questions, we're always here, please email us at oceanservicepress at noaa.gov. Once again, that's oceanservicepress at noaa.gov. This concludes today's press conference. Thanks for being here. Have a good day.